Straight ahead on Long Crime Daily. Opening statements are presented in the long anticipated case of the Pike County Massacre as George Wagner IV stands trial for murder. These murders should have never happened. It was the result of a series of misguided decisions by the defendant and his family. George knew his family had done a lot of bad things in their life, but he had never known of them to ever commit a crime of violence. And the Memphis man accused of murdering Eliza Fletcher faces new charges in a separate kidnapping. Plus, closing arguments are presented in the Chicago federal trial of R&B singer R. Kelly. Will he face additional prison time? And later, he still had difficulties, considerable difficulties, being able to manage multiple things at the same time. A closer look at the psyche of the Parkland school shooter. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. More than six years after eight members of the Roden and Gilly families were murdered, many as they slept, the first trial begins in Pike County, Ohio. George Wagner IV faces 22 charges, including aggravated murder. Law and Crime's Angela Levy is in Pike County with what the jury has been told. Lawyers for George Wagner IV say he is innocent because he didn't actually pull the trigger on a gun that killed anybody that night back in April of 2016. But prosecutors say that George Wagner is just as guilty as his brother Jake and father Billy because he was there that night and helped plan the murders. The three of them in the late, late hours of April 21st of 2016 into the early morning hours of April 22nd of 2016 went up to Union Hill Road to three different locations that you all saw and one location out on Left Fork Road and murdered eight people who did not deserve to die. Special Prosecutor Angie Canepa told the jury that Hannah Mae Roden was the Wagner's main target that night because she wouldn't give up custody of the daughter she shared with Jake Wagner. Others died simply for being there or for what they knew. Canepa said the plan was set in motion in December 2015 when Angela Wagner read a Facebook message between Hannah Mae and George Wagner's ex-mother-in-law in which she wrote, they'll have to kill me first when discussing giving up her daughter. Ding down! The night of the murders, prosecutors say Jake Wagner watched a scene from Boondock Saints 2, a movie about two brothers who have an assassin as a father and the brothers are vigilantes. Prosecutors say Jake and George dyed their hair the week of the murder to look like the brothers in the movie. Norman Reedus is in that film and in the show The Walking Dead. Canepa said Jake Wagner felt he resembled Reedus. She also displayed a screen grab from The Walking Dead that shows a character using a gun with a silencer. Prosecutors said the Wagners made homemade silencers using mag light flashlights and that they recovered photos of Jake Wagner holding a Colt 1911, one of the murder weapons. Prosecutors say George Wagner talked about this on wiretaps. You will hear George telling Jake that he should have gotten rid of the laptop that was confiscated in Montana. He will hear him telling Jake that he should have smashed his phone rather than give it up to BCI. Um, you will hear George telling Jake that his honesty has gotten them into trouble their entire lives, that Jake is too honest. Um, you will hear George mocking God, Jake Wagner will testify against his brother at this trial. And we learned when he pleaded guilty back in 2021 that one of the reasons he did so was because he felt remorse after finding God. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy in Waverly, Ohio. Thanks, Anjanette. In the defense's opening statement, Wagner's attorney said he had no part in the murders, arguing he learned of the massacre through a phone call. Instead, the defense pointed the finger at Wagner's brother and Jake, Jake and mother, Angela. Jake will tell you, George shot no one. Most importantly, there is no re reliable evidence that George planned these murders. There's no independent, reliable evidence that George prepared for these murders. And there's certainly no reliable evidence that George shot anyone. That second thing I wanted to talk to you about is Jake and Angela, who are con artists and liars. We've already touched on it some, but Angela's the con artist through and through.
Joining us today is L.A. Deputy Public Defender Philip Dubay and co-host Terry Austin. Kind of heard that no independent, reliable uh, testimony kind of made my ears perk up. But, Philip, what's the defense's strategy in what looks like a strong case for the prosecution? Well, so far, it sounds like they do not have any evidence that he, in fact, aided and abend uh, abetted or was otherwise... Uh, an accessory, if you will, before the homicide or to the homicide. At most, what you have is an accessory after the fact. And even then, I think the evidence is pretty flimsy. Mere presence, perhaps, at a crime scene or even knowledge of a crime or even inaction towards stopping a crime is not criminal in and of itself. Unless you perform some type of overt act in furtherance of this joint enterprise, this joint conspiracy, then you're just an innocent third party. And uh, I think it's a reach to suggest that George Wagner IV is, you know, like a, a Gotti, a Gambino, a Corleone, or a Soprano. I think it's overfiled. All right, we'll see how the prosecution puts this together. But, Terry, very, very long and maybe a little dry, but how was the prosecution's opening and what should we expect in this trial? Well, Brian, welcome back. Um, <laughs> she did a decent job, but I do agree with you. She was long and she was dry. It's a lot of information, and of course, she wants to get all of that before the jury. One of the things I think was missing in that opening statement was a demonstrative aid. I've said this before. When you have a complicated case, you have to lay it out for the jury. There were not only eight members of, you know, the Roden and Gilly family that were killed, but they have relatives. And, of course, we know that the Wagners have relatives. So I definitely think that having a chart beyond just those people who were involved, the four and the eight, it would have made sense. And the jury wouldn't have to be figuring out how to follow along. They even asked if they could have a pad to take notes. So you know it's complicated. Yeah, let's hope they at least get that for the closing arguments. going to be a lot of moving pieces, people, decedents, defendants. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Well, in Connecticut, a jury has been selected and attorneys are preparing to present opening statements in the second defamation trial against InfoWars host and conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. Eight families and a first responder are suing Jones over comments he made to his audience following the 2012 Sandy Hook massacre, in which a 20-year-old gunman shot and killed 26 and 7-year-olds and six staff members of Sandy Hook Elementary School. After the incident, Jones told his audience the shooting was a hoax, telling his web show audience that everyone involved was a crisis actor and that it was a ploy to push gun control efforts. He has since said he believes the massacre was real, but that his comments are protected by free speech. The eight families and FBI agents suing Jones claim they've endured death threats and abusive comments on social media and that Jones's comments cause emotional and psychological harm. Jones was deemed liable in the three cases against him, the first of which ended in a more than $45 million payout to plaintiffs in Texas. A jury of six will determine how much Jones pays in this case. The trial is expected to last four weeks. Opening statements are set for Tuesday. Switching now to Wisconsin, where the man prosecutors say is behind the deadly Waukesha parade crash, switches his plea. At a brief court appearance on Friday, Brooks withdrew his insanity plea, changing his plea to not guilty. This comes just weeks before Brooks's trial is set to begin on October 3rd. Law and Crime Daily first brought you the story last November, when officials say Brooks crashed his vehicle into the annual holiday parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. They say Brooks did not stop driving when he hit people or barriers. Six people were killed and dozens more injured. He now faces dozens of charges, including six charges of first-degree intentional homicide. Jurors for the trial will be chosen from a pool of more than 300 people. If convicted, Brooks could be sentenced to life in prison. Brooks is due back in court on September 19th for a status hearing. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, closing arguments are presented in the federal trial of disgraced singer R. Kelly. But first, just days after he's arrested for the abduction and murder of Eliza Fletcher, Cleotha Abstin faces additional charges for a separate rape and kidnapping. Welcome back. The man prosecutors say is responsible for the abduction and murder of Eliza Fletcher is back in court for separate kidnapping and rape charges. Earlier this month, 38-year-old Cleotha Abson, also known as Cleotha Henderson, was arrested and charged with Fletcher's kidnapping and murder. Fletcher, a Memphis heiress teacher and mother, went missing while out for a jog. Investigators later arrested Abson, saying he forced Fletcher into his SUV and later killed her. 
Right now, he's being held without bond in connection to her death. Days after Fletcher's body was discovered, Abson was charged in a separate kidnapping and rape incident dating back to September 2021. At the time, a sexual assault kit was submitted to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, but results didn't come back right away. The combined DNA index system, known as CODIS, returned results for the 2021 incident on September 5th of this year, within hours of Memphis police recovering Fletcher's body. For this crime, Abson was indicted on charges of aggravated rape, as well as aggravated kidnapping and a gun charge. All right, Philip, with two cases being so similar, a kidnapping and a rape, as well as a kidnapping and a murder, can the prosecution use evidence of one case in another to prove he did both? Oh, sure. In most jurisdictions, uh, they have a separate statute in their evidence code that allows for the introduction of evidence to prove something other than the character of the defendant. So, for example, it might be offered to prove intent, knowledge, uh, presence, uh, absence of a motive, etc. So, yes, if he, in fact, is engaged in an uncharged act, that is similar in nature to the current charge, it is absolutely admissible. It's always subject to an analysis of it being unduly prejudicial, and the court can exclude it on those grounds. Again, there has to be probative value that is not substantially outweighed by the prejudicial effect, and only a judge can rule on that. Absolutely. Now, Terry, we've talked about this before, and we're a little shocked about the DNA results, but how were they able to connect Abstin to the 2021 rape case so quickly? Well, you know, it's interesting because in this case, they were able to determine that it was his DNA in, you know, days. But in that earlier case, it took over a year to really make that connection. And one of the things that the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation said was that in this case, it was a rush to get that DNA. And in the prior case, there was no rush. So it normally takes 33 to 49 weeks to come back with a positive DNA. But I hope that Philip is right and they can use that prior case, even though there's no guarantee it would have stopped this case. Obviously, that case, there was no murder. This case, there was. I do hope they can make that connection. I do hope the judge finds that it's more probative and that it will definitely determine what his motive might have been, what his intent, what the scheme was, because somehow we really do need to use that prior case to help us. Absolutely. Well, coming up on Law & Crime Daily, after a week-long break in the trial, the Parkland School shooter penalty phase is back in session. Plus, closing arguments are presented in the sex crimes trial of singer R. Kelly. What arguments both sides make as the singer stands trial in federal court. Welcome back. Attorneys present closing arguments in the federal trial of R&B singer R. Kelly as he faces charges relating to trial fixing, child pornography, and sex crimes. Allegations of Kelly's misconduct dates back to the early 1990s. Kelly and his co-defendant and former business manager Daryl McDavid are charged with fixing Kelly's child pornography trial in 2008, in which Kelly was acquitted. He allegedly threatened witnesses and concealed video evidence, including an alleged sex tape with a then 14-year-old girl who did not testify in 2008, but took the stand in this trial, admitting she was the one in the video. She told the jury Kelly sexually abused her over a hundred times. In total, four of Kelly's accusers took the stand. Jurors also heard from only one of the defendants as McDavid spent the final three days of the defense's case testifying on his own behalf. After a week of defense witnesses, prosecutors told the judge Friday they needed time to prepare a rebuttal case. But he ruled the case would go straight to closings instead. Kelly was already sentenced to 30 years in prison in June following a separate federal trial on racketeering and sex trafficking charges in New York. He now faces additional prison time. Philip, do you think the defense did anything to sway the jury in terms of the credibility of the alleged victims? Because at the end of the day, isn't, the, isn't that the only defense here? Yes, of course it is. And a lot of it's just going to depend on the makeup of this jury. They're going to be judging and really, really looking at the credibility of the named victims in this case to see if they're just sour grapes, disgruntled malcontents. I mean, let's face it, especially back in those days in the early 90s, when R. Kelly was at the top of his game, he had every groupie, every young person 
hanging on and following him and hoping to get a break in show business or at a minimum becoming a highly paid model. And it, was, it became, in, in, in the end, the land of broken dreams for many of these people. And now they get their moment in time to try to take him down. So we'll see, though, if it carries the day, uh, they will have a lot to respond to regarding the late reporting. Because remember, uh, the girls that testified are now in their late 30s, and they were in their early to late teens at the time of these events. Yeah, it's going to be interesting for the defense. We'll try to turn that in there. Uh, Terry, jurors heard hours of closing arguments. Do you think that's overkill? And what do you expect the verdict to be? You know what, Brian, when you have a very long trial, I think doing a closing that's over seven hours is definitely overkill. You know, I do expect a guilty verdict here. There is a ton of evidence, and I know the prosecution wants to go over that. So does the defense. But look, you got to, at the end of the day, weigh how much you want to get in against holding that jury and making sure they're still engaged and they're listening to what you're saying. The last thing you want to do is lose them when you're doing your closing argument. So I do think that they're going to have to tailor it back a bit. They're going to have to streamline. And again, maybe use some evidence like the videos again to really bring it home to the jury. Yeah, if your closing argument needs a snack break, I think it might be too long, but we'll see how this case continues. When we come back, the Parkland School shooter penalty phase trial. We head to Florida where defense attorneys narrow in on the gunman's rocky childhood. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. The Parkland School shooter penalty phase trial is back in session after a week-long break. On February 14th of 2018, a then 19-year-old gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. 17 people were killed and 17 more were injured. In October of last year, the gunman pled guilty to all charges. It's now up to a Broward County jury to determine whether the defendant will receive life in prison or the death penalty. The trial resumed for day 22 on Monday as defense attorneys continue to make a case for the defendant's troubled childhood. For its first witness of the week, the defense called a clinical psychologist to testify. He described what issues the defendant had when he observed him for a neuropsychological test. This Trails B is a task of um, having to quickly shift the focus of your attention. Um, and he demonstrated significant troubles being able to adjust his, his focus. Um, this next group of tests had to do with uh, a, a, a problem-solving task that was relatively well uh, um, described to him. The instructions were given pretty uh, concretely, um, and all he had to do was just solve the problem, and overall did fairly well, but he demonstrated a lot of rule violations where he would not follow the rules that were given to him. Um, again, that was in the mildly to moderately impaired range. Um, on a task of uh, working memory, this is where a person has to do multiple things at the same time, keep track of multiple things. Um, he was demonstrating considerable impairments, uh, uh, especially when he didn't have a lot of time to kind of get accustomed to doing multiple things. When he had time to get accustomed to it, so this is, at a, this is when he's doing two things at once for a short period of time. This is for an intermediate period of time, and this is for a long period of time. When you had him do it for the long period of time, he was doing a little bit better, but it was still mildly to moderately impaired. He still had difficulties, considerable difficulties, being able to manage multiple things at the same time. So, Philip, this was kind of the lion's share of the testimony today, a psychological testing. Do you feel as if the defense presented any strong evidence uh, that the shooter shouldn't get the death penalty? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. The first thing that he said that was really key in terms of mitigation is that he was moderately impaired. And when we talk about impairment, we're not talking about because of the effects of having, you know, had alcohol or, or a few drugs. It's because of brain damage uh, caused by genetic defects and likely the introduction of intoxicants to the mother during gestation. And as a result, this caused uh, childhood uh, abnormalities in the brain for this child during the formative years. And as a result, it probably made him impetuous. It affected his executive functioning, his cognitive functioning, 
uh, and everything just seemed to go haywire where he just could not control his impulses. And if he could, there was really no way for him to regulate or navigate it on his own. So I was going to ask whether or not this is a strong witness. I'm getting the sense that you do think that. So I'll ask the question this way. How does the defense then build upon this witness when there's so much evidence that the prosecution has in pushing towards the death penalty? What I would do next, I would absolutely bring in officials from the Florida State Department of Corrections, the actual prison itself, who work with the inmates at the clinical level, such as doctors, nurses, social workers, testers, et cetera, to explain to the jury that they have all the resources and that they are equipped to deal with inmates uh, like Nicholas Cruz and that there is no need to execute him and that because he will be gone uh, for life without parole, they can handle it. They can deal with it without having to condemn him to death. Well, thank you, Philip, and thank you, Terry, who had to leave a, a few moments early. Uh, great to be back. Well, thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.